just a little bit about myself and my own background so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, you will pick up that I have, if you're from England, that I have a slightly strange accent. It's because I'm from deep down under from New Zealand. And uh, we, we love uh, teams in New Zealand. We have some very good sports teams in particular there. And uh, perhaps the key to this whole thing is that when you're putting a team together, you need three things. You need to have them, first of all, the right people on the team. And then uh, secondly, you've got to have them in the right positions on the team. You can imagine a football team or a hockey team or cricket team or rugby team or whatever. Uh, if you reversed the positions and put people in other positions, they would be considerably weaker. So it's having the right people on the team the, in the right positions in the team, but then they have to be trained and focused as well about what the direction of the, the task is. And uh, those three things together are perhaps the bottom line of what we're talking about today. So my own background, I, I trained in general surgery. So, uh, and surgery is very much a team sport because you can't do surgery upon your own. You need other people with complementary skills. And then uh, the Lord called me out of, uh, of surgery into full-time student ministry back in the early 90s. I was 31 years old. We're married with a couple of kids. We'd, we'd changed countries to England. We had uh, spent a couple of years in a missionary training college, and the Lord called me out of clinical medicine altogether into full-time student ministry. And I worked for 27 years with the Christian Medical Fellowship, which is an evangelical fellowship of 5,000 doctors and 1,000 medical students throughout the UK and Ireland. And then uh, I was initially head of student ministries and then, then the CEO for 18 years. And then four years ago, I moved out of that into the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which is, if, you, if you're familiar with IFES, the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, we're like, we're like the IFES for the CMFs or CMAs around the world. So we bring together over 80 national associations. So we have a, a team which is, uh, can I say, very diverse in one way and unified in others. They're all doctors and dentists, but uh, we have 65 field workers from 55 different countries uh, who speak probably 30 different languages together in 14 regional teams. So it, it, it creates all sorts of, of challenges. So uh, what I'm uh, going to bring you today is, is really seven principles of how to build a strong team, um, peppered with a few uh, examples, uh, some personal, but, but largely biblical, uh, some painful uh, over, over the years. So first of all, and this should, should go without saying, but the Bible is an extraordinary handbook for managing teams and uh, building teams. It's a, it's a manual for everything, of course. God's word is profitable for teaching, rebuke, co uh, correcting and training in righteousness, that the man of God, the woman of God might be complete for every good work. And so uh, we should study it for the principles. And, and particularly, remember when Paul wrote this to Timothy, he was writing it at a time when the New Testament had not been yet assembled. He was actually writing one of the books that's going to be in our New Testament. And uh, the Gospels, many of them came later than the epistles. And so when he talked about Scripture, he was talking about Old Testament Scripture. And the Old Testament is, is full of lots of different kinds of literature, of course. There's, there's, there's prophecy and there's apocalyptic and there's, uh, there's poetry and there's uh, <coughs> proverbs and wisdom literature and so, and, and so on. But uh, an extraordinary amount of the Old Testament is actually narrative, story. And uh, there are great lessons to be learned from those stories, and I'll be alluding to quite a few of them as we go through. And uh, as Paul said to the Corinthians, it's very important that we learn from both the successes and particularly the mistakes of the past. In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 1 to 13, uh, Paul goes through four of the most painful episodes of Israel's history 
and uses them as warnings. And he says specifically that these things happened or were allowed to happen for our benefit that we might learn uh, from them. And so there are lots of lessons in, in scripture. And as well as mistakes, of course, there are some wonderful examples of great team leaders that I've listed some of them there. Most obviously, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, but also uh, Moses, David, Solomon, Nehemiah, Paul are some great examples of people whose achievements uh, went far, far beyond what any individual could do. And of course, if you have a big vision, then you will never fulfill it without a team. Because and if your vision is not bigger than yourself, then you shouldn't be here. But uh, if you have a big vision, uh, which is, is stretching you and you're struggling to see how it can be possibly fulfilled, well, the answer is it can be if you have the right team on board. And so a team is essential for uh, doing anything really uh, worthwhile as we go forward. So uh, seven principles, and, and we'll work through these. The first thing is, is to know and be really clear on what your vision, mission, and strategy are. Because if you're not, then nobody in your team will be clear and there will not be any kind of unity or cohesion in fulfilling it. And as the leader of the team, you have to spend an extraordinarily disproportionate amount of time uh, communicating the vision, the mission, and the strategy. Now, the vision of an organization or a team is what you will see, what you will see when your mission is complete. So if we're, if we're to do everything, you know, like, like Paul says in Romans 15, there's no more work for me in these regions, he says. So I'm going on to these, these other places. If you reach the point of saying, yes, our, our mission is complete, what are you going to see? That's what the vision is. So for Nehemiah, it might have been the wall completely rebuilt. For Moses, it would be the people of Israel delivered from Egypt into the promised land. For, for the, the 12 apostles, it's going to be the gospel preached in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What's your vision? What are you going to see when it's complete? The secondly, what's your mission? And your mission is how you fulfill and reach your vision. It's, it's, it's the aims of your organization or group that are going to make your vision a reality. And then thirdly, the strategy, how you get from where you are now to where, um, you know, where you want to be. And it's a key aspect of leadership is being able to take your people from where they are to where you want to get and in the same way keep them all together along the way until the vision is fulfilled so know your vision mission and strategy have a very clear uh, understanding of what your your goals are i've alluded to paul already in romans 15 saying that 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 he had an aim to preach the gospel in these various areas before he moved on to others or we'll think of the great commission itself of matthew 28 19 and 20 taking the gospel right to the ends of the earth. Think about Nehemiah and uh, remember he rebuilt uh, with a team the wall of Jerusalem that had lain in, in, uh, in rubble for many years and rebuilt it completely in just 50 days. But you, you see it began with an idea that he had and then he had to get other people on board and he communicated the vision of let's do this very clearly so that people knew what they were signing up to. You need a strong team to help you achieve it. Very famous book, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But one of these seven habits is this, begin with the end in mind. So always keep at the front of your mind what the vision you're trying to achieve is. And you'll find that that's an extraordinary clarifier in terms of what you choose to do because there are any number of things that we could be spending and occupying our time on but we need to be very very focused around what our vision is 
And our, our vision, of course, is only going to be a, a tiny microcosm of what God is doing uh, all over. But it's recognizing what our place is in the vineyard and focusing on that and not being drawn off into a whole lot of other things that, that are worthy, which actually other people are called to do. So, for example, in ICMDA, this is our vision. Uh, you've got to think about y your own vision. A Christian witness through doctors and dentists in every community, in every nation. Now you can see it's, it's joined to the, the Great Commission. It's, it's Acts 1.8. It's Matthew 28, 19 and 20. But it's extraordinarily focused on our particular people group, which is doctors and dentists. Uh, this is a very strategic group because they can get into all sorts of places in the world where evangelists and pastors and church planters cannot get. So that's our vision, that we want a believing Christian doctor and dentist in every community and every nation. Now, of course, we're a long, long way from fulfilling that, but that's always going to be at the top of our mind and always going to give us more things to do. Uh, what's our mission? To start and strengthen national movements of Christian doctors and dentists because we... We believe that the best way of achieving the mission is by is through indigenous groups led by nationals of those countries doing uh, the culturally appropriate things within their own national context. And so where groups don't exist, we start them. Where they do exist, we help to strengthen them in various ways. And then what's our strategy? Well, what's the best way of achieving that mission and vision? Well, for us, it, it, it boils down very, very simply to training, mentoring, and developing leaders. Uh, I was at a, a webinar just in this room a little while ago. Some of you were possibly here as well on, on uh, leaders of Christian organizations. And someone came out with a, a, a soundbite is that you, the work, he said, is to train the people. And training the people will fulfill the work. The work is to train the people and training the people will fulfill the work. And if you think about Jesus Christ, what, what was his strategy? He had three years. Uh, his, his vision was the gospel to all the corners of the earth. Uh, there were any number of things he could have done. What did he do? He just took 12 people and gave himself to them for three years and then set them free. And that was the means of doing it. And so we've got to be very, very focused in, in what we, we do. So there's a challenge for you to think about your own context and what your vision, mission, and strategy uh, would be. <laughs> because uh, out of the vision and the mission come all the other things in your uh, enterprise, whether it's a church or an NGO or a parachurch organization or a movement or whatever. Your vision, your mission, your values, culture and beliefs, the things that make you distinctive, uh, what the specific goals are that you might have to fulfill your mission, you know, what, what you're trying to do in a particular country or church or whatever, uh, your strategies to achieve that and the new initiatives that you start and then uh, out of that projects that will, will, uh, will come. So there's the first one. Um, <clears throat> Be clear on your vision, mission, and strategy. Because if you're not, then uh, there is no clear signal and people do not know what to do. Uh, number two is play to your personal strengths. Because any great work needs a team made up of people with very diverse personalities and giftings and uh, past experiences, all of us uh, have strengths and weaknesses, and we need to know what our weaknesses and strengths are and not try to be people that we are, are not. And I, I think it's a big trap to look at some other uh, leader and try to model yourself on them because you may be a very different, have a diff very different set of gifts, be a different personality, have very different past experiences, because God is preparing every single individual in his church for specific tasks. And so just as in a, in a team, if you're a great center forward, you don't want to be playing in goal or on, on the wing. 
you need to find the place where uh, you're best suited. If you're a wonderful violinist, you should not be trying to play in the wind section or in the brass or, or percussion. So we find out what we're good at, and that may take several decades of our lives to be able to do that, and then uh, be in a position where we're playing to those particular uh, strengths. And there are <clears throat> all sorts of ways that know your gifts. There's the list of spiritual gifts in, uh, in Romans and Corinthians. Well, we all have them as Christians. We don't all know what they are. They might not be well developed, but we need to understand how it is that God has wired us and made us and enabled us to do and play to those strengths. And then uh, there, are, there are all sorts of useful uh, leadership, personality guides and things, which I think none of them is the full package, but they're all very helpful. I've, I've found them personally very helpful to, to know the kind of person I am and therefore not to try to do the things that I can't. And then uh, to focus on your particular calling. What is it that God is uh, calling uh, you to do? Acts 20, 24 is Paul with the Ephesian elders where he says, uh, I've always made it my ambition to preach the gospel where it hasn't been known before, you know, so he was, and to fulfill the calling that I've been, been given. So uh, within uh, Christ's big calling to the church to gather people from every nation to herald in the return of Christ and the, and the new heaven and the new earth, what's the specific role that he's made us for and to, to play? Uh, be constantly learning and, and developing. Anyone in a leadership position in an organization that is dynamic and growing will inevitably find that their job description changes every year because there are certain things that they used to do that they no longer do because they're either not necessary or because other people have come on the team who can do them perhaps much better than they could. But also as the team grows, there are new skills and roles to be fulfilled, which the leaders had to be prepared to move into to uh, mark the way forward. And so uh, through our lifetime, we have to be uh, lifelong learners. And then uh, surround yourself with people who are strong in areas where uh, you are you are weak. Uh, one of the greatest compliments I, I ever had was from a former boss who said to me, he said, when I look at you, I'm puzzled as to why you've been in any way successful. But as I thought about it more and more, I realized that the trick is that you identify people who have strengths that you don't have and you sort of gather them around you. See, that's a great compliment, what do you think? But um, w w one of the problems of leadership is that we, we get into a position where we're very comfortable doing the things that we do well and therefore reluctant to hand them on to others who might not do them as well. And we can end up in a position where we're, we're not dy dynamically empowering the organization, but rather controlling it and stopping it growing and developing because of our reluctance to move beyond our areas of comfort into areas where we're going to initially uh, struggle before we start to master them. So play to your personal uh, strength. This is the Myers-Briggs. Hands up who's familiar with Myers-Briggs. Most, uh, well, at least half of you are okay. So, I, I found this very useful. Uh, I found it in my teams it was really helpful to know what the personality backgrounds of people were so you knew how to get the best out of them, what to do and what not to do and so on. And uh, most um, <coughs> leaders, or if you look at CEOs, about 90% about, uh, of all CEOs come from just five of these 16 uh, groups. Now, uh, that means that there are people whose personalities are not suited to leadership, but, but that, that doesn't in any way diminish it because it means they're much more suited to doing jobs which uh, those in leadership cannot do and should never be trusted with because they'll make a complete disaster of it. And so uh, you can see uh, within, within this, uh, the, the five... Um, 
uh, leadership ones, they tend to be the, the STs and the NTs, um, uh, particularly the, the Js of each. So um, ISTJ, ESTJ, INTP, ENTJ, and, um, and, the, and the, the, the one outlier is the ENTP, which happens to be the one uh, that I am. But it, it's useful to, to, if you haven't done a Myers-Briggs screen, do it. Uh, find out what you are. Read about the characteristics. You'll find there'll be a lot of things that uh, that gel as you go through it. Uh, another one, I, I, I found this even more useful. Uh, Myers-Briggs is about personality. This is about uh, strengths finder, uh, finding your strengths. And these are a mixture of personality, characteristics, gifts and abilities, uh, passions, uh, and so on. There are 34 of them all together. You do the survey and it gives you your top five strengths. And then you can read about each one of those and, and that will help you to see the kind of role in which you're going to be most uh, effective. So number three, um, <coughs> be accountable. I've already said surround yourself with <coughs> with uh, strong strong leaders. And uh, this is, of course, uh, exactly what the, the apostles did, what Paul did. A, a lot of his work was into building his uh, apostolic teams as he went around. Paul never went alone on his missions. He always took one, two, or three, or four people with him, and he was training them and apprenticing them along the way. Uh, in an organization, build an effective uh, top team. In other words, a, a group of usually no more than four or five people who uh, have the major responsibilities and management in the organization. And uh, we, we saw COVID as a wonderful opportunity to do this because I, I was quite new in my, my new role and it's a great uh, temptation always to be actively doing a whole lot of things, which I did during my first year of 2019. And then when COVID st struck in 2020, we had to completely rethink our ministry, which was all based on big regional conferences and funding field workers to travel, and we couldn't do either of those. And, and the first thing we did after that was to put together uh, a top team, a group of, as it turned out, six people who met regularly, every initially every week, then every couple of weeks. We now meet every four weeks uh, for at least an hour and a half, two hours at a time to catch up with where each other are, to plan, to uh, test strategies, uh, and so on. I think of of, of um, <clears throat> the the story of of David, Second Samuel, with his with his top team, uh, all people with specific roles. Uh, take painful rebukes from critical friends. It said that a board member should be a critical friend. And other, they're a friend in the sense that they really desire to support you and see you succeed and they're committed to your spiritual growth and performance in your ministry role. But they are critical in the sense that they are quite uh, ready uh, for the good of you and the good of the organization to make criticisms uh, in order to stop you doing uh, crazy things or to see uh, how you are. And uh, again, you've got some some biblical examples there, but uh, one of them, of course, is Exodus 18, which is a story of Jethro, Moses's father-in-law, who didn't come out of Egypt with him, but, but came to visit him in the wilderness and uh, ob observed what he was doing and then gave him some absolutely life-changing advice about uh, delegation and appointing people to key roles within the nation of Israel. And had that not happened, uh, Moses would have imploded and the whole enterprise would have ground to a halt. So uh, don't surround yourself with uh, yes men and yes women who are continually singing your praises, but people who love you enough that they're prepared even to risk their relationship with you in order to tell you the things that you so desperately need to hear but are currently deaf to for whatever reason 
be open about your, your struggles. Again, a wonderful compliment I had from uh, one of my staff when I was at CMF, he was the head of student ministries. And he said, it's so encouraging working with you. I, and I, 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 he said, it's been such a wonderful experience for me. And so I'm all puffed up, ready to receive this compliment. And he said, the reason it's so encouraging is that I'm thinking if God can use someone like you, then maybe he can use me as well. And, and particularly when you tell me about the ways that you've messed up in the past and the mistakes you've made, I think, well, maybe it's okay for me also to be, uh, you know, making mistakes. And of course, they say only a fool learns from his own mistakes. Uh, and it, of course, I, I don't think that that's true. It's important that we learn from our own mistakes, but it's also incredibly important that we learn from the mistakes of others. And uh, surgery is a great career in that in that line, is that you uh, you see the things happen that no one ever talks about outside the profession, and and you learn about the mistakes and and wrong pathways that you can make uh, as you go along the way. And I put the example there of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is one of my favorite books because Paul really lets us see his heart and he talks about his inner struggles. He talks about having fears within. He talks about being so utterly, unbearably crushed that he despaired of life itself. He talks about the burden of the churches and, uh, and sleepless nights uh, and so on. And we must not create the impression to the, the people and the teams that we're leaving, uh, leading that we're some kind of superhuman people who never make mistakes, if we can be open about our struggles. And I'm not saying that we should wear our hearts on our sleeves because we can go too far that way, but there are situations where sharing about a specific difficulty or struggle with someone uh, who you're working with can be a, a great encouragement uh, to them to believe that God can use, uh, you know, in God's grace, he can use them in the same way. So uh, I talked about senior teams. This is our particular senior team. They come from uh, five different countries. Uh, they probably speak between them about uh, 10 different languages, not, not myself and my fellow Kiwi, but uh, the others. But the, the diversity and the richness of, of, uh, of help and encouragement that they, they bring uh, has been tremendous. So build a, a senior team around you uh, because this is what, you know, we want to avoid. We don't want to be one of those casualties that, uh, you know, we read about on the, on the media or on the, on the Christian grapevine who did not listen and who got themselves into a position where no one was able to criticize them. Uh, everyone backed off and was afraid, usually because of the reaction that they would get if there was uh, any any uh, criticism. And I'd, I'd highly recommend um, Marcus's book, Powerful Leaders. I, I think there are many strengths of this book, but but one of the, the main strengths of this book, I think, is the way uh, Marcus goes in and describes the process of a leader going off the rails uh, from the very earliest stage and what the warning signs are that if not checked can become worse and then ultimately end up, uh, at, you know, in, in the position that we don't want to, to be. And uh, this is about team building and not about, um, you know, our personal lives, but of course we could, we could speak about the most important thing that you can give your team uh, of all is not training uh, or encouragement or, um, you know, great ministry strategies or a wonderful vision, or a clear plan, or great communication, or any of those things. The, the greatest gift we can give our teams is our own personal integrity and example. Because if we do not embody what we're talking about, then uh, we're not going to be uh, we're not going to be successful in in a in a biblical sense. The Margaret Thatcher, um, different opinions of Margaret Thatcher. She was. Uh, a great leader in, in the UK. Uh, she, she also had her critics. But this is a great quote, I think. And, and if you've 
if you've seen the film that was made, this comes out in it. And I think it's the high point of the whole film where she says to one of her ministers, watch your thoughts because they become words. Watch your words because they become actions. Watch your actions because they become habits. Watch your habits because they become character. Watch your character because it becomes your destiny. So it all it starts with our thoughts and uh, our own uh, leadership of ourselves in terms of walking a holy and disciplined life but before the Lord and, and recognizing where we are on this uh, spectrum. Because, uh, the, uh, of course, you can read this you can read this two ways. You can read, watch your sinful thoughts because they become sinful words. Watch your sinful words become sinful actions. But if you talk about, turned around the other way, watch your righteous and good thoughts because they establish good speech, good actions, and uh, habits that will protect you in terms of going forward and making you effective. Number four, uh, select and position. And fundamental to this, of course, is, is, is prayer. You remember when the disciples came to Jesus and he said, the fields are ripe under harvest. Therefore, because there are only 12 of you, you have to work incredibly hard and each do the, the work of, of 100 men or 10 women in order to fulfill the mission. Do you remember Jesus saying that? No, no, no. What he said was that the fields are ready for harvest. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to raise up workers for the harvest field. And uh, the enterprise in which we're involved requires many, many people. And so fundamental to that is, is prayer, asking God to raise them up. But then it's about uh, selecting uh, staff and volunteers carefully. And it, it's far, far, far better to select the right people at the beginning than uh, to, to have to deal with uh, people, the wrong people, uh, later down the track. And we see Jesus right at the beginning that, that he goes off, doesn't he, and prays and fasts for a whole night and, and uh, would have spent lots of time uh, before that uh, thinking about it, before he actually selected the 12, knowing that actually one of them was to be uh, a traitor. But selection is extraordinarily important. We could, we could speak a lot more about that, the, the seven C's and so on. Look for faithful people and give them jobs to do. The second Timothy 2.2 2 is about what you've heard from me and trust to others who will entrust to others and, and so on. So uh, we talk about the importance of finding fat people for the ministry. Fat, F, faithful, A, available, and T, teachable, fat people, but uh, particularly people who are faithful. So for, so for people, when you give them a task to do, they fulfill the task. That's what a faithful person is. Uh, recognize people's specific gifts and encourage them in those. So, so don't try and put uh, round pegs into square holes or, or vice versa. Um, this is one of the great lessons of parenthood, isn't it? That uh, we've got three kids. Many people have more than that. But everyone is different in terms of the gifting and personality. And one of the worst things a parent can do is to have a plan for a child and then force them into that plan rather than praying that they'll have the wisdom to recognize the kind of person they've been given to to, to uh, steward through parentship and, and try to encourage them and direct them into doing the things that, that God has uh, prepared them to do. So finding people's gifts and encouraging them in those, you know. My, ki my three kids are very musical, and, um, but, but they all play different instruments. And it was interesting to find, there was a, a, a process for each one to find that actually the instrument that they were really passionate about and could play well, and not just because, you know, their grandfather played the violin to, to think that they would all be violinists. Uh, and the same goes with gifting and take time to select the very best people for key roles. I'll, I'll move on, but the verses are all there for you to, to look up for. 
uh, again, this is just il illustrative of what of what we do. Your own organization is going to be different, but uh, I've, I've shared with you our vision, our mission, and our our strategy uh, or our focus, which is all about training leaders. But then you have to uh, give people specific responsibilities within that. And so we uh, we divide the world into 14 regions. And some of these are linguistic, like Francophone Africa, the brown region there, and others of them, or, or like uh, Eurasia, the former Soviet Union, where most people will speak Russian, uh, or and, and other areas are more geographical, like, like Europe, for example, or Oceania, um, or, or the Middle East, North Africa region, where everyone speaks Arabic. We say there are six and a half thousand languages in the world, but if you take doctors and dentists, virtually every doctor and dentist on the planet will speak one of seven languages. And so that really helps us in being able to plan resources, organize events, and so on. Uh, we know we don't have to produce stuff in every, in every language. So uh, within each of those regions, there's a regional secretary. He has area reps and student reps working with him. He has national bodies uh, and, and so on. And everything is uh, clearly defined in terms of what the, the, um, the job uh, is. So, um, you know, we have a, a regional structure uh, of national movements, regional committees and secretaries, other field workers. And then we have the countries uh, in our, in our, um, in the region. So, so this is the region of Francophone Africa, and this is just an example. If, if you have, if our vision is a Christian witness everywhere through doctors and dentists, and our aim is to start and to strengthen groups, and and our and our focus is training leaders, then uh, in terms of measuring that progress, we give every country a color. Uh, and so green countries are, we have national groups which are fully affiliated with our na national movement. The orange countries have national groups that are moving towards affiliation. The blue countries have individual contacts, but not yet a national group. The gray countries have nothing yet. And so we're always looking, and all our staff understand this, to move the gray countries to blue, the blue countries to orange, the orange countries to, to green. As we, as we go forward and trying to fulfill our vision. And number five, empower and develop. So making developing people your key priority. The work is to develop the people and the people will develop the work. Uh, why is Romans 16 in our Bibles? Well, I, I think maybe the reason is it's just a list of names, isn't it? Uh, quite extraordinary, over 20 names of people who Paul knew in the Church of Rome, in spite of the fact that he'd never visited Rome up until that point. But what it tells you is that Paul made a huge priority of building relationships and developing friendships uh, with people, making people his key priority. Recognize and supply the training and support they need. So do you see your staff and volunteers just as a workforce, or do you much more importantly, see them as a group of people that you're seeking to grow and develop, whether they choose to stay with you or not for the long term. If you make their training and development your priority, then they will be doing the same with others. Uh, encourage, stir up, and speak well of your, of your team. Uh, you may say hard things in private, but in, in public, always be uh, praising them and lifting them up and drawing attention to the good things that they've done. Uh, delegate to increase the work and relieve yourself and move on to other tasks. So in, inevitably a leader will always find themselves stretched and it will raise the question, what is it that I'm doing that, I, that doesn't need to be done? What is it that I'm doing that could be passed on to another person? And if a person can do a job 80% as well as you do, then you should absolutely be delegating it at that, at that point. Uh, and, and what is it that needs to be done that no one is yet doing and that only I can probably do, that I need to free myself up in order to, to do? In CMF, we had, we had a motto which was, do what only you can do. Do what only you can do. So in other words, if, if, there, are, if there are tasks which you're doing that other people could equally do or do 
at least you know 80 percent as well then they should be the ones doing it and you should be letting go of them so that you can do what only you can do and uh, be prepared to be disempowered and see others succeed so remember uh, john the baptist i must decrease but he must increase and uh do we have that attitude to our team that we really desire to see them grow and develop and ultimately to replace us uh gently persuade don't don't argue be gracious in the way that we deal with people um so we uh, covid was 90 percent blessing for us uh, because it forced us to completely change our strategy globally and do things in a different way and particularly to use uh, small group uh, adult learning techniques on the on the internet using zoom and so on so we we started up a whole series of training tracks which have since multiplied uh, all over the world it's a story uh, in itself but we have eight different training tracks running each one of them runs for 10 weeks each one asks for a three hour per week commitment from people one and a half hours watching video reading responding to to reflective questions on an internet platform where they can interact and then a one and a half hour meeting as a group no more than eight to ten people three facilitators who've done the course before and and running over 10 weeks and we do we do it in these uh eight different areas and then at the end of, of the group you choose out who are going to be the facilitators for the next group so we started with three we started with three uh groups of 10 people doing three different courses we're now in the sixth generation of courses and we're still keeping going after COVID. and at any one time we've got about 25 uh 10 week tracks uh running in parallel each half year and all of them are led by people who uh did them as students along the way and so it, it's a model uh aimed at multiplication you start as a trainee then you become a facilitator and then you become a coach who is a, an encourager of facilitators and uh, a multiplying model so just an, an example but um one one thing we we didn't anticipate when we set this up was that we were thinking well, we're doing this to train future leaders but actually the first thing it did was help to train our own volunteers and staff who then became enthusiasts for it and then uh, passes on uh, build our good systems so uh, you need to be very clear on your organizational structure what every person's uh, job description is uh, and uh, bad systems can destroy an organization now if, if you don't have a website that works a database that functions an accounting system that works uh, systems that are, are malfunctioning you can be drawn into uh, interminable uh, time wasting trying to put them right but uh, one thing that I've, I've uh, learned by bitter experience is that actually good people will build good systems and will also fix uh, bad systems and so when systems aren't working usually the problem is that you haven't got the, the right people to fix them or the or or the people who you can train to to do it so uh, again it comes back to getting good people uh, and getting them in the right places organizing your team where we talked about getting people in the right places uh, go go and read first kings 4 about uh, solomon's techniques but he was a, a wonderful builder of systems recognizing what needed to be done and putting the right people in place and um, plan carefully for major uh, projects we see a great example of that with Nehemiah in uh, in rebuilding the wall and so uh, any uh, effective organization uh, it you know whether it's a church or um, a an NGO or a, uh, a parachurch organization will have uh, governance first of all so uh, a board agreeing policy strategy budget overseeing finances and employing the ceo that the the board's main job is to manage the ceo or the leader whose job is then to manage the organization our staff and volunteers the only difference between staff and volunteers is that our staff are paid and volunteers aren't but the expectation should be the same and the job description should be as clear and the uh, and the tasks 
should be a, as well uh, planned and, and constructed. <clears throat> we have only 12 staff who were paid a salary. We've got 65 field workers. None of them receive anything from us, but we do pay for their expenses and their travel, for example. And uh, we've found that if you have a limited budget as, as we do, that the best way of expanding the work is by using volunteers. And then out of your volunteers will come initially part-time paid staff members and then full-time staff members. And you've got a good opportunity to look at who the best suited to the roles are. Uh, structures, a clear uh, structure with lines of accountability. Everyone needs to know who they're answering to. Established systems. And then, uh, of course, the, the various resources. So it's just an example. Uh, this is a, a program called Expense Plus, which is uh, available in the UK. And uh, as a, a relatively small charity in terms of our staff size, we were looking for something that would be really cheap and effective and fit for purpose that we could program. And we found this organization who'd produced this and we've helped them to develop it along the way. And we've got a, a system that deals with all of our accounts extremely well, very easy to use and it costs us virtually nothing. We just pay a, a monthly retainer for it. But if you can find uh, a good system, <clears throat> when when we were getting going with ITMDA, when I uh, moved into the CEO role four years ago, uh, I, I went around the world to look at what our various national groups were doing. And the, the CMDA, Christian Medical and Dental Association of the US, went and visited them. And, and I spent half a day with the IT people who run all the communications and websites. And my questions were, you know, what applications do you use in order to do this? And I came back, came back to the team and said, you know, we, we need, as it turned out for us, Word Plus with a, a program called Beaver Builder as, as a, a, a plugin, and it'll do everything we want to do. And it's, it's worked out brilliantly for us and very cheaply. So, so look for, look for systems that are going to work for your organization. This is another one, Slack. Um, I talked about training programs. This is a great program for uh, reflective questions and interaction on the internet, far better than trying to keep track of things on, on WhatsApp or whatever. So for every, every uh, time we, we run a, a program, so maybe we're having a module on um, objections to the gospel or something like that, and they'll watch their video and they'll read their reading material and then they'll have some reflective questions and they go there and they can answer them. They can all interact with each other and it stays there for time and memoriam as a resource to use. So I'm mean, again, they're just examples. And then finally, mitigate against relationship failure because <laughs> inevitably it's going to happen. As I've said earlier on, you can avoid a lot of difficulty by taking a lot of care about who you select into, into roles. And if you get people that they may be, they may, may well be Christians with wonderful testimony and good characters and great gifts and so on. But if, if the chemistry is not there, or if they just don't buy into the culture of the organization, or if your vision is not something that fires them up, then uh, you can save yourself a, a huge amount of grief and difficulty by, uh, at the beginning, not appointing them and encouraging them to go somewhere where their gifts are going to be better suited and uh, better, better used. It's far, far more difficult to move people on who are already in, in post, who are causing real problems for the organization uh, than it is to take care of a, a selection uh, early on. Uh, the example I've given there of Second Samuel uh, 13 to 19 is, is, of course, the story of Absalom. And uh, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about how David got into that mistake. And of course, you know, he, uh, he didn't have a choice about Absalom being his son, but the way he handled it and, and the way the, the damage that Absalom did in that, uh, it, to the nation at that time uh, was quite extraordinary. Uh, don't fail to remain accountable. We talked about that. Don't get frustrated with your with your team. Remember Moses. Uh, one of Moses's 
mistakes was around the water from the rock. You know the story where where God said, "Speak to the rock, and and I will uh, you know produce water." And of course, he didn't. He uh, he struck the rock. He went beyond it, and as a result, Moses was not able to lead the people into the promised land. Uh, but the root of that was a dissatisfaction and frustration with the fact that people were whinging, moaning, whining, and complaining about things. And uh, whinging, whining, moaning, and complaining is, is something that's very difficult to, to handle, but he handled it the wrong way. And it's far better to assume that if people are performing poorly or, uh, or causing difficulties, always turn the hold up the mirror first of all and ask yourself, what am I doing or what am I not doing that is contributing to the difficulty of this situation? And uh, try to put that right, you know, taking the, the, the log out of one's eye before you uh, try to deal with the, the situation. Don't be jealous of your team members. Remember, that was Saul's great downfall, wasn't it? That, that instead of rejoicing that he had such a great guy on his team, uh, David, he got jealous, and that led to his his downfall. Uh, learn to rejoice when the Lord brings along people onto your team who are far more talented and have far greater potential than you do, because this means that eventually they will take on some of the things that are a burden to, to you. But but far more importantly, that your team will grow because you've got good people. Don't fail to invest in key relationships. That was part of the problem with Absalom. Don't be too, un uh, too uncompromising or too hard a taskmaster. This was Rehoboam's problem, wasn't it, with the, the northern nation of Israel and led to the division of the two kingdoms because he was too tough when he should have been more gentle and winsome and, and welcoming and accommodating to, to people. Um, but also remember that relationship breakdown is not the end and that God is sovereign over it and that ultimately we, th we think uh, the big bust up that Paul and Barnabas had was actually for the good of the kingdom, uh, ultimately, because it multiplied the work and later there was reconciliation.